morning. Welcome, welcome. I hope this space feels like a refuge, a safe place, a safe time to find rest for weariness. Those of you that have been here before know, but for those of you who don't, you can find links to our worship guide and our connect card right here. And hopefully they're a helpful guide for you as we worship together. And we also have an email that you can share your prayer needs with us, prayer at redeemercommunity.com. How do we pray? Why do we pray? What do we expect when we pray? Tell him, be still with him in those moments. And let's dwell on these words from Jesus, from Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Are you tired? Are you worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it and learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Let's all keep learning together how to worship him with our whole lives.
How's it going, Redeemer? If you have your Bible, open up to Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. When you think of the phrase, caught in the crossfire, what comes to mind? Maybe for you, you think about a military battle. Or if you're a movie person, you might think of the rapper 50 Cent and and his movie from 2010. Or if you're like me, you're thinking your favorite childhood game, the theme song to the Milton Bradley game, Crossfire, right? But the idea is that there there is like hostilities happening, two parties, and that someone's in the middle and what's happening around them is affecting them in a negative way. Well, today, Daniel is receiving a vision. And in the vision, he sees the future of Israel. It's, It's mostly the the past for us, but it's the future for him. He sees the future of Israel, and Israel is caught in the crossfire between two powerful nations as they battle back and forth, and it's affecting them negatively. And what we're going to see at the end of today is that this is true of us as Christians, as followers of Jesus, is that in the world, we too are caught in the crossfires of the world, and it's negatively impacting us, but there is a way for us to fight for faithfulness in a post-Christian world. There's a way for us to fight for faithfulness even when it's hard to follow God's ways, all right? So today's gonna be really good, but it's also gonna be crazy, all right? Chapter 11 is crazy. What I mean by that is that it's prophesying a lot of future events for Daniel, so much so that in the first 35 verses, there are over 100 prophecies that are historically fulfilled. So as Daniel's writing, looking towards the future, he's writing with the accuracy of a historian. Right now, some people think that maybe this was written after the fact, and that's how he got so many things right. But what we saw in chapter 8 is that's just simply not possible. If Alexander the Great read from the book of Daniel, that means the book of Daniel had to have been written before Alexander the Great, not after. And also, if you read the Gospels, like Mark and Matthew, specifically Matthew chapter 24, when Jesus talks about Daniel, he talks about Daniel in a way that shows that he believed Daniel wrote these words. So these were written in the 6th century BC. They were not written after the fact. Um, They were written beforehand. God's word is, is always true, even when it looks towards the future. All right, so let's just jump in. Verse one, it says, as for me, now me, right here, the me. That's an angel that's been talking to Daniel since chapter 10. So an angel is still talking. As for me, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I stood up to confirm and strengthen him. This is not the main point of the sermon, but I think it's important to mention, okay? An angel is standing up to confirm and strengthen a worldly leader. Darius the Mede was not concerned with the things of God, but God was using him to further God's mission, okay? So Darius the Mede was not concerned with furthering God's kingdom, but God used him in such a way that his leadership pushed God's kingdom forward, okay? So all I wanna say with that is, we have a new leadership in our country, And whether you are for them or against them, you should pray for them to be strengthened in the Lord. We should pray that God would confirm and strengthen them in such a way that they are pushing his kingdom forward, whether they realize it or not. That should have been our prayer for the last four years with Trump. That needs to continue to be our prayer for the next four years with Biden and Harris. So let's pray for our leaders, okay? Pray that God would strengthen them. Pray that God would use them in such a way that the kingdom of God continues to march forward into the world, okay? Not the main point, but something important to mention. All right, verse two. And now I will show you the truth. Behold, three more kings shall rise in Persia, and a fourth shall be far richer than all of them. And when he has become strong through his riches, he shall stir up all against the kingdom of Greece. Then a mighty king shall arise who shall rule with great dominion and do as he wills. And as soon as he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken and divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not to his posterity, nor according to the authority with which he ruled for his kingdom shall be plucked up and go to others beside these. So what's happening in the book of Daniel is at the very beginning, Babylon was the world power. They, they conquered Israel and brought them into captivity. Then after Babylon falls, Persia steps onto the scene, the Persians and the Medes, And they allow God's people to make the 700 mile journey back home. So God uses Persia to get his people back to the temple, back to the holy city, right? So so after Babylon, you have the Persians and the Medes and the next world power is Greece. 
So it's mentioning these different kings. So the, the king that fights against Greece, that's Xerxes, right? So it's, it's prophesying Xerxes, right, in, in the first part of Daniel chapter 11. And then in verse 3, when it talks about the mighty king, it's beginning to prophesy the Greek king who will rise up and conquer the known world, who is Alexander the Great. Now, we talked about him earlier, but Alexander the Great conquers the known world in about 10 years. By his early 30s, he has conquered the known world. Then he dies with no heir. And so his kingdom is divided amongst his, his four leading generals. Now, so that kingdom, which was one, becomes four. And now in verses five through 20, we're gonna focus in on two of those four. Specifically, Egypt, which is the kingdom of the south, and Syria, which is the kingdom of the north, okay? Egypt is the south, Syria is the north. Why do we focus on these two kingdoms? Because right in the middle is Israel, caught in the crossfire. Okay, look at verses five and six. Then the king of the south, which is the king of Egypt. These are the Ptolemies, by the way. The king of the south, the Ptolemies, all right? The king of the south shall be strong, but one of his princes shall be stronger than he and shall rule, and his authority shall be a great authority. After some years, they shall make an alliance, and the daughter of the king of the south, so the daughter of the king of Egypt, shall come to the king of the north, which is Syria, these are the Seleucids, to make an agreement. But she shall not retain the strength of her arm, and he and his arm shall not endure, but she shall be given up, and her attendants, he who fathered her, and he who supported her in those times. So here's what happens historically, right? You have Ptolemy II, and he wants to create peace with Syria. And he's thinking, like, maybe if we do like this, this alliance where my daughter marries their king, that'll just that'll relieve the hostilities and we could be unified. So Ptolemy II takes his daughter Bernice, and he's like, I want her to marry the king of Syria. That's, that's Antiochus II. So he's like, Bernice, would you marry Antiochus II? Now, Antiochus II had a wife and a son. So that, that son should have been the heir to the throne. Right? Well, what happens is Antiochus II divorces his wife, disowns his first son, so he marries Bernice. Marries Bernice, and then they have a son, and that new son is, is now on the track to, to one day be king. Right? Now, this is drama. I'm talking the real housewives of, of Syria. This is, these are the days of our lives. Right? Because what happens is his ex-wife ends up having him killed, Bernice killed, and their son killed, so that the first son, her son, can now be king. So like, they tried this alliance thing, it just didn't work out, okay? Look at verses seven through, through nine. It says, and from a branch from her roots, one shall arise in his place. He shall come against the army and enter the fortress of the king of the north, and he shall deal with them and shall prevail. He shall also carry off to Egypt their gods with their metal images and their precious vessels of silver and gold. And for some years, he shall refrain from attacking the king of the north. Then the latter shall come into the realm of the king of the south, but shall return to his own land. Right? So when I was in my mid-20s, out of college, past that stage of life, uh, I was with a friend. And my friend was a frat boy. Right? He was a Fiji at the University of Auburn. And so we're in Athens, Georgia, where the University of Georgia is. And apparently there's this rivalry between Fiji's at UGA and Fiji's um, in Auburn. The Fiji's at UGA, they had a plaque that recognized them as being the best national chapter. Like out of all the chapters of this fraternity, they were the best. And so the Fiji's in Auburn didn't like that. They didn't like the UGA guys bragging about how they were better. So I, have, I, I didn't know about this rivalry. So we're in, we're in Athens, Georgia. We go up to this house. I'm like, what is this? It's the Fiji house. And we just walk in like we own the place. People are, there are guys in there doing things. And we're just walking through like we own it. Just walk, And I'm like, what are we doing in this frat house? I've never been in a frat house. And so we walk and he goes to this wall. And on that wall is a plaque from the national chapter of Fiji saying that they're the best. And he's like, I'm, take, I'm taking this, All right? There's just something insulting about having something you prized um, taken from you and then brought to a foreign land, okay? So what's happening here is Bernice's brother, right? Ptolemy III, he's, he's upset, right? He's upset at what went down, that his sister got murdered. murdered. So he marches, he marches into Syria and he conquers Right? He conquers um, Antiochus II's wife's 
son who's ruling conquers him and then takes all the images of their gods back to his frat house in Egypt. So I'm taking these with me, right? Just to, to completely insult them. So once again, like we see more prophecy fulfilled here. Okay. So what happens in verses, in verses 10 through 16 is that, um, is, is that, um, is that this kind of fights, okay? And Ty is, is that, that there's new rulers in place, okay? There's new rulers in place. Now, Antiochus III is on the scene, okay? So Antiochus II is gone. Um, Antiochus the Great, Antiochus III is now on the scene. He fights against Egypt, okay? He fights against Egypt because like Egypt has their gods. So he's fighting them. And as he's fighting them, he gets absolutely dominated, just beat. So he goes home. He's like, I'm, I'm defeated now. Now what happens is when Antiochus the Great fought Egypt, Egypt should have just put their foot on his throat and stomped him out and killed him. But instead they let him go home where he licks his wounds, regathers himself, gets stronger. They'll, eventually he comes back and fights again. And then he overthrows Egypt. Like he comes back and he wins, right? Now what happens in verses 10 through 16 is just showing how Antiochus the Great is having his way with Egypt. This guy's just... He's doing his thing. He's dominating them. But look at verse 17, all right? So as Antiochus the Great is dominating Egypt, there's a lot of hostility. And he's like, I'm just tired of fighting. I'm tired. Like we gotta create peace. So, so in 17, he has a plan of, of how can I just create peace between Syria and Egypt? So it says, he shall, that's Antiochus the Great, he shall set his face to come with the strength of his whole kingdom and he shall bring terms of an agreement and perform them. He shall give him the daughter of woman to destroy the kingdom, but it shall not stand or be to his advantage. So what happens in verse 17 is he's like, okay, I'm gonna send my daughter to marry their king because that worked in the past, right? So his daughter's name is Cleopatra. So he sends his daughter, Cleopatra, to marry the, the, like, a, a young prince in Egypt, thinking that she'll be a spy and that ultimately it'll be to his advantage. But instead of Cleopatra being loyal to her dad, she ends up being loyal to her husband and it totally backfires on him. So he gives away his daughter to be married to a foreign king and instead of it being to his advantage, it's to his disadvantage. It just doesn't work out. Look at verses 18 and 19. It says, Afterwards, he shall turn his face to the coastlands and shall capture many of them. But a commander shall put an end to this insolence. Indeed, he shall turn his insolence back upon him. Then he shall turn his face back towards the fortress of his own land. But he shall stumble and fall and shall not be found. So what happens to Antiochus the Great is, is eventually he starts trying to annex you know, Greek islands. And as he's doing this, there's a new rising power coming up, right? Just getting stronger and stronger and stronger. That rising power is Rome. So Rome warns Antiochus the Great, Antiochus the Third, like, you gotta stop this, you can't do that. Those, those are not your islands. And so instead of him listening, he doesn't. And so what happens is, is they beat him up and it still doesn't work, so they beat him up again. And when they beat him up again, they take one of his sons, Antiochus the Fourth. they take one of his sons as a POW. All right, so they take one of his sons away and then they find him. They're like, and you owe us all this money. So he goes home completely defeated and he's like, where am I gonna get this money to pay the Romans off? So he goes to the temple of Jupiter and starts robbing the temple. And people are like, what are you doing? That's like, it's like someone taken from the offering plate at church. It's like, you can't do that. And so, so he's robbing the temple and the people get mad and have him killed and they never find his body. This is like the Irish mafia in New York City burying people in the west end zone of the New York Giants stadium. It's like, what happened to the body? We don't know. It just disappeared, right? So they can't find his body. Another prophecy fulfilled from the book of Daniel. So now Antiochus the Great is dead. His son, who should have been king, is a POW. So his other son takes over, and that's verse 20. Then shall arise in his place one whom shall send an exactor of tribute for the glory of the kingdom. But within a few days he shall be broken, neither in anger nor in battle. So here's what happens to his son. His son inherits this debt to Rome. So he's like, I gotta get money, so I'll get, I'll get a tax collector. And this tax collector will go out and he'll collect taxes, get the money and I'll pay off Rome and we'll be good. We'll be done with that debt. Well, this tax collector who he thinks he can trust, instead of collecting taxes and helping him out, ends up having him poisoned and so he dies, but he doesn't die in battle. He doesn't die like his dad at the hands of an angry mob. He dies simply from someone he trusted poisoning him. So another prophecy fulfilled, right? So what happens is that tax collector is like, well, I guess I'll be king. So he's trying to be king, 
But something else happens. Look at verse 21. It says, in his place shall arise a a contemptible person to whom royal majesty has not been given. He shall come in without warning and obtain the kingdom by flattery. Without warning. So what happens is this tax collector is like now trying to become the king. Turns out that Antiochus IV, Antiochus the great son who's a prisoner of war, has been released from Rome. He's coming home and people are like, how do we get this guy to be king instead of the tax collector? And so through flatteries, through some bribes, he works his way to assume the throne that was his in the past and now he gets it. So now all of a sudden Antiochus IV is king, right? So what happens is Antiochus IV, um, he is basically the Hitler of the Old Testament. He becomes known as Antiochus Epiphanes. And we talked about him in chapter eight. He just does unspeakable evil things to God's people. Well, in verses 20 through 28, or 21 through 28, Antiochus is just ruling and reigning and and doing all kinds of things. But in verse 29, the, the things change. It seems like he's just dominating, but in 29 things change. At the time appointed, this is a time appointed by God. He shall return and come into the south, right? So he'll, he'll come to Egypt, but it shall not be this time as it was before. For ships of Kittim shall come against him and he shall be afraid and withdraw and shall turn back and be enraged and take action against the Holy Covenant. He shall turn back and pay attention to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. It says, forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and fortress and shall take away the regular burnt offering and they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. Okay, so so here's what happens. He's having his way with Egypt from 21 to 28, just having his way. Well, in 29, verse 29, what happens historically is that Egypt combines forces with Rome. And so when he goes to fight them, it's like Egypt isn't like they were before. They're stronger because they've got an an ally with them. Well, they humiliate him. I mean, I'm talking absolute humiliation, like drawing a circle around him in dirt, just daring him to cross over the line. Like, and so, so this guy is just humiliated. Now, when I was in fifth grade, fifth grade, I loved to play basketball in my driveway. Me and my friends would always play in the driveway. Well, there's a kid that lived across the street. He was three years older. Now, fifth grade to three years older, big difference. Well, that kid was better than us but he wasn't as good as his friends. So a lot of times when he couldn't beat his friends, he would come to my driveway and then he would beat us just to make himself feel good, right? Cause like, I'm gonna beat up on these little kids and just show that I can dominate them. Well, that's what happens to Antiochus Epiphanes. He gets embarrassed by the Egyptians and the Romans. So he goes to the little kid on the street. He goes to, to Israel and he just starts beating them up. That's what I said, he's the Hitler of the Old Testament. Here's what he does, he kills over 80,000 Jews. He sells another 40,000 into slavery. He takes the temple and completely desecrates it. I mean, he, he, uh, he puts up an altar to another God. Um, he takes a pig, an animal that the Jews consider to be so unclean and, and he kills it on the altar that was ultimately supposed to be for a lamb that was pointing to Jesus, basically saying your savior to me is a pig. He spreads blood across the temple, pig blood. And and then he takes all the holy sacred scriptures. He he throws them out on the grounds, has people trample on them. And he even starts burning every copy he can find. He does unspeakable evil things to God's people. Okay, well in verses 32 through 35, what happens is some people just say, it's easier for us to just be on his team than to fight against him. We're, we're tired of losing. We're just gonna, we're gonna switch teams. We're gonna join his, his side. But others fight to stay faithful, okay? Others fight to stay faithful. Now, verses 36 through 45, if you're just reading through chapter 11, verses 36 through 45, it seems like it's still talking about Antiochus Epiphanes, but there's a problem. All right, where verses like one through 35 have all been fulfilled historically, like as we look through history, like all that stuff took place, the stuff that happens in verses 36 through 45 are not fulfilled through the life of Antiochus Epiphanes. So there's not a clear transition, but it, it would seem that now Daniel's talking about someone else. So what I believe is happening in verses 36 through 45 is I believe that in Daniel's vision, he thinks it's one person, But as we see history unfold, we realize it's actually talking about someone else, right? That Antiochus was an antichrist type 
in that now in verses 36 to 45, it's talking about the ultimate antichrist. So here's what prophecy does. Imagine having a, a collapsible telescope. As you're looking at a collapsible telescope, it looks pretty simple. It's like it's one piece, you look through it. But what happens is you can unfold it and it can become three pieces. And it becomes more complex and as you can see more details with the length of it. So what happens with prophecy, for Daniel, it, it's like a one piece telescope. But as we look at it historically, it begins to unfold. It, yeah, it's the same thing, but it's, it's a little bit more complex. So I believe that that earlier it's talking about Antiochus Epiphanes up to verse 35. But as history unfolds, we realize that in verse 36, if Antiochus Epiphanes was a lowercase a antichrist, verses 36 through 45 are beginning to talk about a capital A antichrist who is to come in the future. Now, these verses talk about the end time stuff, um, and, and they, they really, they tie into chapter 12. So the reason why I believe this is ultimately about an antichrist to come is because of verses one through four in chapter 12. We'll talk about that next week. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna reserve verses 36 through 45 for next week as we wrap up the whole series in Daniel 12. So if you wanna know about the end times, you gotta come back next week, okay? You gotta come back next week. So that leaves us with, with kind of like our conclusion of chapter 11. So what do we do with it? Well, here's the, the big thing I want you to get today. The big takeaway is this. As God's people, we are always in the crossfires of this world. We see that's true of Israel and it's true of us today. As God's people, whether it's Israel or the church, as the church today, as God's people, we are always in the crossfires of this world. Well, let me read two things for you real quick out of, out of chapter 11. Look at verse 32, just the first part of it, and then verse 39. Now, verse 32 says this, He shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant. We'll stop there. The he is Antiochus Epiphanes. It says that he's going to seduce with flattery. Right? He's going he's gonna, to... He's gonna make it seem good to violate God's ways. He's gonna make it beneficial to violate God's ways. And look at verse 39. All right, verse 39, it says, He, Antiochus Epiphanes, he shall deal with the strongest fortress with the help of a foreign God. Those who acknowledge him, he shall load with honor. So those who flip teams, like he's gonna honor them. And it says, He shall make them rulers over many and shall divide the land for a price. What we see here, is that, is that Antiochus Epiphanes makes it more profitable to be ungodly, right? Antiochus Epiphanes wants it to be more profitable to, to be ungodly, that it would be less profitable to follow God's ways and more profitable to go against God's ways. Now, why I wanted to point out those two verses is because as we've gone through the book of Daniel, I wanted to point out that there is one reality, but two realms. One reality, two realms. The two realms are that there is a physical realm, which we experience, and there is a spiritual realm, which is unseen, okay? And what we see throughout the book of Daniel is that what's happening in the spiritual realm, what's happening in the unseen, impacts and affects how we experience the seen. It, ex it impacts and affects the physical realm. We, we see that time and time again. So if we were to pull back the curtain and, and see into that spiritual realm, Daniel shows that there's this spirit of Babylon. There's the spirit of the Antichrist. There are angels that are strategically placed in geographical locations. And, and these spiritual forces are working against God. They're, they're fighting against God to stop the work that he wants to do in us and through us to the world. So these forces are against us, okay? And so what we see in the book of Daniel, and this is like that, that collapsible telescope unfolding, is that Daniel's not just showing us what has happened. Daniel's not just showing us what will happen. He's showing us what always happens. And so here's what I know. Here's what I know. What always happens is that these spirits, the spirit of Babylon, the spirit of the Antichrist, the, these demonic angels, these spirits make it more profitable to be ungodly, where it's easier to follow the ways of the world than to follow the ways of God. I mean, think about that. What have you, or what are you experiencing that lets you know this is true? I believe you know this is true. You know it's, it's more profitable to be ungodly than to be godly. It's easier to, to follow the ways of the world than to follow the ways of God. So, so what's... What's happening in your life right now? What are you going through? Or, or what have you recently been through that just lets you know, like, yeah, that's 100% true. Look, I, you know this 
to be true. So as God's people, we're always in the crossfires of this world. There will always be people, movements, and influences trying to pull us away from who God wants us to be and how God wants us to live. Let me say that one more time. As God's people, we're always in the crossfires of this world. There will always be people, movements, and influences trying to pull us away from who God wants us to be and how God wants us to live. All right, so, so what do we do? What do we do with this? Well, look at verse 32b, like the second half of verse 32. Then, then, look, at, then look at verse 40. All right, verse 32, the second half says, But the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. Let me read that one more time. But the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. But we'll, just, we'll, just, we'll just leave it with that for a second here, okay? We'll leave it with that. Um, what happens in verses 32 through 35 is that people stand firm and take action. We know this, this to be filled, verses 32 through 35, to be fulfilled through the Maccabees. Right, the Maccabees rise up, the hammers, and, and they, they fight against guerrilla warfare and they take back the temple, rededicate it, celebrate that through the holiday Hanukkah, even to now. To now. Like, right, like, the, like this is fulfilled. But what they do is a huge lesson for us today. Okay, what, what they went through and what they did is a great lesson for us today. Here's what I want you to get. God uses times where the church is persecuted to refine us, and purify us. Okay, look at, look at verse 35. Look at verse 35. Um, it, it says this, and some of the wise shall stumble so that they may be refined, purified, and made white until the time of the end, for it still waits the appointed time. Refined, purified, and made white. God uses time where the church is persecuted to refine us and purify us. And what happens is we become people who are filled with a higher proof gospel. And that higher octane combusts more powerfully. And so throughout church history, throughout church history, what we see is that time and time again, when the church is, is most intensely pressed in on, that's when the church also most powerfully pushes out into the world with the hope of the gospel. So church history just shows us when the church is most intensely pressed in on from outside forces, from that crossfire, what happens is we're pressed in on, we tend to most powerfully push out with the hope of the gospel, right? Like we most powerfully push out from times where we're most intensely pressed in on, all right? So what I would say is that the church right now the church right now is positioned like never before to fulfill God's call on us to go and make disciples of all nations. That, that's the great commission, go and make disciples of all nations. We are positioned like never before to fulfill that calling on our lives. We're positioned like never before. So the question is, why haven't we or why aren't we doing that? Why haven't we or why aren't we fulfilling that? And here's what I would say. Maybe it's because we need a season of purifying and refinement. Maybe what we need is a season of purifying and refinement. Okay? Because as we live out our faith in a post-Christian America where it's getting harder and harder to follow Jesus, we have to decide Will we take the easy path and go with the flow? Or will we be like those who know their God, stand firm, and take action? Okay, you see, Jesus is our greatest example of faithfulness in hard times. And what happens is, is in Romans 8, 11, it says the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. So our hope to, to know God, to stand firm, to take action, to fight for faithfulness, it's not in us, right? In our own strength, it's through Christ in us. Right? It's, it's I can't, but Christ in me can. So we look to Jesus and find our strength in him. And that's why I love taking communion every week. 
Uh, sometimes when we take communion, we remember um, what these elements, the bread and the juice represent, that it is Jesus' body given for us and his blood spilt for us for the forgiveness of our sins. But what we're doing is, is we're taking these elements and we are internalizing them, right? We're, we're internalizing them and remembering that this is real. But here's what I want you to do today. Yes, take time here in a, in a moment to, to confess sins and to remember why Jesus gave his life for you. But also, I want you to remember this. God didn't, God didn't send Jesus just to die for your sins, just to save you from your sins, but also to save you for a new life. The cross doesn't just save us from our sins. It also saves us for a faithful life, to follow God's ways and to push the gospel forward into the world. So as you eat and you drink, ask God to be real to you and ask for him to be your strength to fight for faithfulness in the world that you live. God, thank you for your word. God, thank you for the book of Daniel. Um, God, we see that you are true to your word. Um, We know that you will return. We know that until that day comes, you've called us to fight for faithfulness. And that's something that we can't do on our own, but you've given us the power of the Holy Spirit to help us and to guide us and to lead us. So God, be our strength. Help us to faithfully follow you, even when it's hard. Purify and refine your church, um, even if it's hard, so that we can be pushed out into the world for your great purposes. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Friends, real quick reminder, the links on the screen are going to take you to our worship guide, connect card, and our email for your prayer needs, prayer at redeemercommunity.com. You can also be a part of what God is doing here at Redeemer by giving financially. You can give anytime by texting RCCJZ to 77977. Thanks for partnering with us and sharing hope. We want to be a refuge to the weary inside our walls and outside. You know, we talk a lot about being a God-honoring community here at Redeemer and loving one another well, but how do we actually do that in the day-to-day? I would love to hear from you how you're loving your family, friends, neighbors, strangers right now. You know, God says in Isaiah 58, 10 through 11, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in the scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. There is peace for you today and hope for you tomorrow in the person of Jesus. Grace and peace be with you, my friends. So
You are in control.